consistency and build quality, reliability, and of course sound quality has to be the first one. It's what we've built our business on. If it doesn't sound right, we're not gonna sell any anyway. You can actually see there's a, uh, a turntable, not a record player, but a turntable with PCB boards on, and what we call a biscuit, so they're the same boards. This spins around, and these mechanisms shine light through the board to see if there's an aperture or not. And if there is, it knows a component needs to go in place. And it will punch the discrete component through the board, bend the leg and snip the leg to a particular length on the underside. And believe it or not, that actually added massive consistency and sound quality control for us. So the components come off this bandolier, <clears throat> they go through the system, are punched through, and the waste material ends up in this bin. I think the cleverest part of this machine, and it's still kind of almost Willy Wonka and the chocolate factory. Have a look at this. So the components, they come along here. They can see the waste, the used sections. The components come along here, they drop into this trough, this conveyor belt, and then they get vacuumed through this tube into the machine and fired into the board. Who thought that was a good idea? It is a good idea, it works, but like, it's so ambitious. Um, I find this incredible, I really do. Who, who invented it? I think it was Germans. Yeah, of I course. think it was a German <laughs> machine, of course, you, yeah, yeah, yeah. The chassis is made, the chassis then goes off for test. When this passes, they get married together, so the chassis and the fascia get connected. That then goes back up for a further test to make sure the whole system works as a whole. Because there's no point in us putting the fascia on here, wiring the volume pots in place, and finding out that this board's faulty or the fascia's faulty. We do it in two halves. It's actually a far more efficient way of catching a problem and not wasting time building things too far forward down the line. But it also gives us one other advantage. It means that approximately everything you get is tested six times before you end up getting it into your hands. So if something does go wrong, we're really, you're really unfortunate and we're deeply embarrassed. Yeah. And again, you can see these windings are tapped off in this fashion. We could do straight lines, we do this curve, it adds a spring, it puts suspension between the transformer and the main board, and therefore it gives it less chance of transmitting noise. Yeah. Well, this bit's tied down, the preamp section is floated. Okay, so we strap down the output stage because you need to transfer heat, but the bit you listen to, we suspend. And it still works. Yeah. That way, yeah. you don't have to float it's, the whole board. It's Well, floating is the best way to do it, but if we float this board with a brass weight, it goes up by about a thousand pounds. I don't believe it exists. I hear that you shake cables, and we show them the machine, and still some people think it's just up for show, but we genuinely use this product. And we found that by shaking cables, you distress them. And if you take a cable, let's look at this DIN cable. Okay, it's nice and loose. If I put a twist into it, it, start, it becomes rigid. You start to get rigidity. So that links one product to another. And the more rigid that becomes, the more coupled the source is to the preamp, for example. Microphonic. Microphonic. Yeah. So by shaking these cables, you actually make them loose and you can dress them. And that's really what you want. It's this nice, loose, flexible cable. There's many theories. To this day, we cannot measure what's truly going on. Yeah. But we know that if we shake a cable, if I got somebody to make two cables, same person, shook one and left one unshaken, if I did you a, a blind dem, if I did you an ABX dem, you would pick the unshake, the shaken one every single time. It's quite, quite an impressive process. And this was stumbled across. We don't know if it's loosening the cable around the, uh, the, the sleeve around the inner cores, which is most likely the case. Because when it's on a drum, it's really tight. So you take all of that stiffness out of the cable and this becomes quite baggy around the inner cores. When you add heat to a, a pin with solder, you stress that section out. So making that more flexible helps the sound as well. So you can't make all of these cables and stand there shaking them 172 times one end and 172 times the other end. It would just take forever and you'll probably end up with industrial industry. So we made this system. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, we're just checking for stability. Um, we, we have two types, we have 317s and 337s. And I've got to paint the top of these so they don't get mixed up. Because they, they look exactly the same. Um, exactly the same dimensions, everything, just a different value. So I have to paint the top of them. Um, some of them we send out to companies to build our boards. Some we use in house. But that's a noise meter, that's an oscilloscope. And it just shows how stable it is. If it's all over the place, we know it's noisy. And it's going to affect the sound in your unit if you put one in. So I could have loads of good ones in a unit, but it only takes one noisy one and that could upset it. So I have to go through every single one. Every we don't want to take this one. gets tested? Yes, yeah, yeah. So we do a lot of selection like this, making sure we don't get noisy components. So when you design something like Statement, which is 100 kilos per box, okay, you start thinking, okay, how do I move this to build it? How do we transport it to somebody's house, home, wherever it may be? And if you look just behind you, this crane is just one of our processes that we had to have fitted into this environment to allow us to build our flagship amplifier. Without this, people will become injured, of course. Things become damaged, broken, the performance drops. Most important is we don't want to damage our chief engineers that can build these things. And people's health is paramount at name. This allows us to build safe product, reliable product. And this bed here, for example, <clears throat> they can activate a ball bearing system which raises above this bed to allow us to move these jigs around. You can see they're actually very solid. When this is raised, they float around quite happily. Without this, you're gonna be stretching, leaning, bending, not making the right solder joint, maybe scratching a component or a surface. So this is essential for making the very best product at this size and weight. So we had to think of everything. It wasn't just the safety legislation, which is obviously the most important thing. It was about how do we make this consistently one of the things that we're very good at at name is if I'm fortunate enough to own a statement and so are you and so are you they should all more or less sound the same and consistency and sound quality is key we're, we're so uh, certain that we, we, we provide this that a, a review sample isn't a special one that we make we don't put extra special components in the one that you receive for review is the same that our end user, that I would use at home, that we would use in our demonstration room. That is something we're very proud of, consistency. When, when Roy George designed the CDS, our very first CD player, which was launched in 1991, um, one of the things he stumbled across was decoupling boards, sprung loaded. And at the time, everybody was putting a decent suspension into CD mechanisms. And largely because if you walked by or tapped to them, the CD would physically skip. The mechanism would, would have a problem handling the CD. And that was important for reducing error correction as far as we were concerned. As far as we were concerned, you shouldn't jump up and down near your CD player. You should let it play a CD. So the suspension was for reducing error correction. But one of the things Roy was interested in at the time, as he was playing with sprung systems, was PCB boards and he plugged the CD player into an oscilloscope to measure the noise floor. And remember Lin can speakers? Mm -hmm. We had lots of Lin speakers back in the day because obviously we used to use lots of their speakers and so on. And he played this Lin can directly to the PCB board of a CDS, an original. And the oscilloscope went crazy. And he actually had suspension built underneath. And he released the suspension, which he had jacked up with some flat blade screwdrivers to make it rigid, and rested the board on springs. And the oscilloscope became ruler flat. And this new, to him, was, was, was gold, because this was actually removing noise from the circuit board. And you were physically seeing more signal amplified and less noise. And that's always been our, our mantra ever since. So if we look at this board, which is hung, it's actually on a sprung system. You see the springs inside. The wobbly amplifier. Yeah, another wobbly bit. So it means that any noise can't get into this section of the amplifier. I hold this rigid. Yeah, fully, this flex like fully, it's great. 
Yeah. So it sits on four springs. Each, oh. each. Oh, I say sit. It's hung on four springs. I should say. And this is the preamplifier. This is the preamplifier. Yeah. yeah. To some, they say, "Why is it built this badly?" <laughs> okay. We say it isn't built badly. This actually is decoupling the outside environment to the product. And if we look here, we have its circuit breaker. The last thing we want is energy and noise hitting this mundane switch. Once it's in the on position, that's good to go. We don't really want this having any play or interaction with the overall circuit. Things like um, the terminals on the back here, they've actually got a compliant grip inside so that they're slightly decoupled, but they hold the speaker cables in place, be it a spade connector or a four mil connector. The engineering inside, again, people say, you know what, this is over-engineered hi-fi. At name, we believe this is necessary. There's no such thing as over-engineered hi-fi. This is how we believe it should be at name. Why do you <coughs> use DIN plugs? Okay, the reason we use DIN plugs is because it's the electrical standard for signal. RCA is a DC coupler, and it was used for connecting voltage from one point to another. Mm -hmm. DC coupler, it's used in lighting systems. And the, and the Far East made it popular for an audio signal. You have this RCA plug, big fat cable, and it was hi-fi jewelry. <clears throat> it's much easier to solder as well, let's be fair. Yeah. But actually, there's several problems. You know with digital cables, they're 75 ohm yeah. impedance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So ideally, you want a BNC, which is a 75 ohm plug. True. Yeah. The line level impedance is 50 ohm impedance. An RCA plug is 200 ohms. So when you put one at each end of a cable, you get something called reflectivity buildup. Yeah. And that recesses all those lovely details and information. Things like piano notes that drift off into the distance get cut short. Yeah. And isn't it possible to create an RCA plug with less impedance? There is. There are plugs around which exist. They're still not as good as DIN plugs. One of the overall improvements with DIN, there's another couple actually, the mechanical interface. Yeah. If you get an RCA plug, have you noticed some are impossible to fit? Yeah. Some are quite loose, some yeah. are just right. With a DIN plug, they're always correct. You have a wiper system, so there is no eddy current running around your signal like you do with an RCA plug. But the golden one is this, star grounding, central earth systems. Mm. If an electronics company shows you a circuit board with beautiful star grounding, when everything comes back to one point, yeah. okay? As soon as they exit with a pair of RCAs, all of that work inside is lost. Because you have one earth grant, one reference. As you come from an RCA, you have left and an earth, right and an earth. With a DIN, you have left, right, and one earth containing both. So you, so you keep continuity with grounding within the product.